Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Tyler Edlin. I've been a professional concept designer and illustrator now for over 12 years and I have over hundreds of students every year and I see a lot of the same kind of common art slip ups and basically choke points where artists tend to have a lot of struggles. So I'm going to give some awesome tips today to help address some of these. This is going to range from color light composition to some more subtle nuanced aspects. So whether your goal is just to simply improve on a personal level, to start a career, maybe it's to start making some moolah with your art, I think there'll be something here to help you out. And the best part is I'm going to take this student study, again, something I typically see and go over. This is from a live session we had, and I'm going to be painting over it, and we're going to transform that into a Zelda painting. So uh, let's begin. There's a lot of content dropping this month on the Brush Sauce Patreon, so if you want to support this channel and get premium access to lessons, demos, and exercises to prove an accelerated rate, there will be a link below. So whether it's advanced design techniques, behind the scenes working with clients, to drawing fundamentals, there will be something for everyone. Thanks for your support. Color and light, you know, and painting light in general is like 90% of what I have to do. It's like what we have to do as artists to really make an image work. That, you know, kind of goes in tandem with composition, but I personally believe that is a major deciding factor whether or not a particular image is going to be successful or not. You could see here in these early phases of the, the student submission, the perspective was there, uh, the overall structure was there itself in terms of like we're not changing the composition so much. And even that tonal read in terms of light or dark is reading on the students. But what is not working on his and many others in this particular case is the color and light aspect of it. A lot of that really is going to come down to uh, really lean into the emotions to drive it. So when I look at the reference photo depicted there on the left, I, I, I start to feel, you know, a lot of things. It's like, oh, it's like this cool, bright morning optimistic, beautiful lighting that's absolutely subtle in, in many little ways. And I think it's it's our job often enough as the artist and designer, if we're, we're looking at a subject like this, we have to find the way to portray the best version of this, right? That That's the tricky part, as it turns out often right like uh, uh the designer will come to me and say we, we need a key art version of this like here's some ugly kind of pictures of it make this the best version of it they literally say that and that's that's hard to do because that that means it's going to require a few things on your end to get the most out of a picture the first is gonna you need to lean into your own emotions to really drive this so when i look at a reference i'm interpreting whether it's for study or whether it's for a professional job i have to think like how is this making me feel? How do I want it to make, you know, each and every one of you, how do I make the audience feel with that? And I need to like pull those colors that pull into those colors that really do that. So for like bright morning and, and I remember, and I think like, and I close my eyes, like what, what colors do I really think of like on the ideal morning? Well, there's like some nice teals, there's some, a little bit of that nice cerulean kind of blue, a little bit of green and yellow, a little bit of that right springtime kind of flair coming into it how can i bring all of that into this because like you know at the start the the cathedral it was just it was a lot of gray on gray on gray and that and that's how we originally a lot of us right i'm sure some of you are there some of you are working past that now it, it's literally the art of observation and seeing color because like when we think of okay rocks are gray the sky is blue Clouds are white, grass is green, right? And and that's even from a childhood, that's where we start to really put the foundation of our pictures in and, and what our own uh, perceptions of what these objects and what the subject really is. And once you can kind of work through that and more so base your picture off of color relationships, is this lighter or darker? Is this warmer and cooler? You can start to play aspects of the image you know, off itself to your benefit, to the viewer's benefit. And that's why earlier on, I'm just taking, I'm breaking this thing down, 
pretty much starting a lot of the pieces from scratch or I'm just slabbing in a bunch of richer colors and, and richer colors for me means like I need to build these up. They're not just like more saturated versions of what is existing here and to uh, some degree that that's what it looks like, but it's it's building them up. Good color really needs to be kind of developed and it's it's nothing that's going to happen in one direct sort of pass. And, and so with color and light and, and on a picture like this, I do recommend to always use a reference, but this is where the trap that this particular student fell into, they trusted it 100%. I don't think they quite hit the color depth, even that the photo is, but a lot of photography is just going to be flatter in general than a painter can you know, typically depict that. Um, and it's because the shadows get flatter, everything gets a little bit more uniform. We can really our, our, train our brains to kind of see and develop that color senses further. Nothing's going to help more than that than straight observational work. I, I don't recommend even photos from this is not as strong as like just getting a subject in front of you and trying to paint that and really just observe those color relationships. So rather than depicting objects and elements as colors and symbols, which is, again, a, ma a problem a majority of us will face, let me know below if you, you're dealing with that as well, but it, a lot of that ends up being flat because of color constancy. Again, our brain's tendency to interpret an object's color the same under different lighting conditions. So not only do we have to push an object's color on a situation by situation basis, but like that's going to change depending on what that lighting is going to be doing. Do we want to amp up the bloom? Do we want to add a little bit of a glare effect? You know, things that are typically typically only going to be captured through a lens, but they can, you know, a little bit of sparkle at the end of the picture can go a long way. So we have to fight our brain's tendency of telling our eyes to auto adjust the color, you know, for these different uh, conditions, so that we uh, really don't buy into that, that false sense of constancy. So the next major tip is clarity, right? It's about the message, what your art has to say, which ties into that whole color and light, you know, leaning into emotions to drive that. But I like to think of this as like harmonizing the way we deliver the focal point. And it will be, you know, that foundational structure. And this always has to be simple and clear. This was not at all like a problem with, you know, this particular example that's on screen today. I think it would, you know, this is a glorified version of this you know, ruined abbey or church, right? And I think it does that very clearly. But like I mentioned before, I want to try to not only paint the best version of this, but I'm going to go that extra step further at the end just to add some characters from a series that I'm passionate about, that I really care about. So when I start to add these multiple layers, and you don't have to, but it's something I, I genuinely like to do, and I've got really good results uh, from, from my work from doing so. It's a way to kind of take the back door into doing some fan art in a sense as well. <laughs> so it, it's fun. I like it. So not only am I making a, a beautiful picture, I, at least I think it's going to be beautiful in its own right, right? Just painting a gorgeous, you know, ruined structure on a, br you know, bright, sunny, feel good morning day, but I'm going to tap into nostalgia. I'm going to tap into joy, all these things that I think of when I think of the Legend of Zelda series. And, and I'm hoping if I do my job all right, that it will make, you know, some of some of you and some other fans of the franchise also feel that in a very similar way. And again, this is all elements of that message is, is right. It's emotion. It's storytelling. This is going to be about Neo Zelda embarking on this peaceful sort of stop. Maybe they camped out in the, uh, the evening here. And I got the, the I, and again, I'm going to add the characters at the end. Uh, but like, I'm trying to, build its own more superficial narrative level to it as well. And really, this is just an attempt at me trying to convey my own subjective reality. Part of this, which is not an equation here, is the camera angle and staging. You know, how are you arranging the body language of your figures? What sort of props are you including or not including in your scene? Definitely take 
a moment to measure and weigh every little decision of every little aspect that you're going to put, you know, into your picture. The sharpness of a shadow to how warm the light feels can really start to tell different stories, you know, for different pictures. Uh, the next major tip I want to cover is form, line, and mass. Every picture is made up of a combination of these three things. I'm going to do my best to kind of describe here what these are, but think of them as the visual DNA of your picture. This picture has, that I'm working on here is really just about form. I'm using color and light and of course shading to show this scene in a three-dimensional sense. Pictorial pictorially speaking, of course. Uh, secondly, though, it is made up with some mass. Now mass, think of this as the shapes of light and shadow and how clear they are in a particular picture. Think of a really good example of mass as like a comic book page, right? It's all about the shapes of light and shadow. Now the last part line, this is probably the easiest overall, but it's like, is there a visible line throughout your picture? Visually, no, not for me. I'm not using any line art. There won't be any line in the final. But some of your pictures, of course, and I love beautiful line art, that's the top rung, right, on, on your aesthetics. Like, you go for the line art, you keep it beautiful, keep it direct. Then maybe you add mass as a secondary element where you shade, right, some light and shadow into that and never even get into form, which is, like, the main staple of a lot of my work. But that's that's great, right? There's something for everybody. The thing is with with not so much this, it was a problem with this piece, but it, it can be a, a huge problem for many of us is choosing, and this may be more of a, a sub talk of topic about style itself, but just choose to have a clear hierarchy of line form and mass. Things get muddy very quickly when, and, and work will look very unfinished when there's kind of an equal emphasis on all of those things. So it's like, you know, what is it kind of going for? Is it, is this a sketch that's colored? Is this a sketch that's shaded? Or is this a painting that's not finished? It, it has a, in more cases than not, a fairly poor effect on your painting when there's not a very clear hierarchy of what you're particularly going for aesthetically with the line, uh, the painting of the form or the shapes. Let me know below if you have any questions about that. I, I did my best to explain it there. A course for this, and I have many videos. I'll link, maybe I'll link them below in, in regards to style decisions. But knowing your own strengths and weaknesses when it comes to form, line, and mass may or may not play in that for you. But as long as it's something you're actively, something you're consciously thinking about, I think that's going to help you take your art further. Like for me, I know I'm a little weak on the line. It takes me an excessive amount of effort to get good line art. So I tend to go the other way and just paint form because one of my personal strengths is depicting color and light to show objects in the scene. So I, right, I go with that. And I always am a sucker for graphic shapes. So regardless if I go line or form, graphic shapes of mass is always the second most important thing you know, in my pictures. And you can see that on this cathedral, like there's one side that's clearly light, clearly shadow, the shapes of windows are shadow. Uh, the pillars have a graphic pillar shape to them. And there is a graphic reflection and on the bottom side of the hill, also a very clear graphic shape. There's very clear families of light and shadow in most of my pictures. It, it doesn't always have to be that way, of course, but it's something I genuinely like to, to play into. Now, the other major thing, which, you know, we're starting to get in here uh, on this painting as I go smaller and smaller with the brush strokes and the details is the materials. This is a massive thing for a lot of us to get through. Um, and I often see loads of this happening, you know, whether it's in the discords or Facebook group, but it's going to make your painting look flat because it's going to show you have a lack of understanding of your subject matter when you literally go in there and, and treat and paint every object 
almost like the exact same way. Okay, this is light. I'll get it lighter on this side, but this is darker. This is darker. On... It's not always like that. Certain colors are more reflective. Certain colors are going to bounce. Certain colors are more rough. And, and it's our job often, you know, those of you that are also painters like me, we have to put the brushwork in that's going to differentiate one thing to the other. Nature in general is particularly great for this because it's something easy to observe. The materials work in very, literally very natural ways. It, it's a little more challenging when you start to do man-made objects like the metals, like the, there's a lot of subtlety in those, like things like rubber, right? Leather, plastic, like things that are translucent, like gummy. These are all objects that greatly kind of practice this. And once you can start to, you know, build up and, and depict the differences, the, the quality of your work is going to improve tremendously. So with, with materials, start with something, again, you can easily reference, Start very simple. Don't jump into man-made things with like artificial lighting. You know, like a typical cyberpunk scene, that would be like very difficult. And that's why, again, I see a lot of students painting that sort of stuff because it's fun and it's cool, but they run into a lot of roadblocks with like making, you know, the, the ground look wet or the, the grungy metal, you know, reflect a certain amount of light, you know, where the, the paint's chipping, it, right? It gets, it gets complicated quickly. So start simple, gradually amp up the complexity of your materials. Your scenes will, over time, start to come to life more and more. Literally, the more you can imply things as well, rather than, you know, spending all day uh, like just pixel picking, like, individual like that's why you're seeing on on this scene i'm not zooming in i'm i'm implying a lot of stone with relatively few brushes Mo 90 percent of this painting was done with like that square kind of chalky brush now the last tip here today is a little more difficult to grasp because it's a bit broader and it kind of comes from my portfolio video where you know i've always been told you're portfolio is only as good as the as your weakest image right and that that comes from of course like you being employable with your art and your portfolio and you know we all have bad days we all have days where we are a lack of motivated we all have days where we didn't sleep as much as we want we all have days when there's high stress aspects of our life unrelated to our art happening and we still if we're you know, doing art for a living, we have to perform. And yeah, on those days, the art probably is not gonna be as good, right, as it will be on a ideal day. And so for like potential employers, again, and for yourself, that body of work is gonna, you know, they wanna know you're they're getting you at your worst as a baseline, which is why that worst piece is always emphasized just as much, if not more, than your best work. But I want to go a step further. This is also true where with an individual image, it's only really as good as the weak points within it. So like if I nail 90% of this picture and I totally throw in a derpy looking character that doesn't match the style, doesn't in it, but even though that character is probably only like, you know, 10% of the picture, it's going to bring down the quality of the entire picture. It's going to ruin the feeling. It's going to ruin the emotion. Uh, likewise, if if you just have a character as well in a scene and you're you're botching the anatomy of the proportions of it or things go, this is more common now for environmental art. But if you're doing something and you, you paint either a set of staircases, a door or a window that is so far out of scale, it, it's going to be a very big weak point or you botch the perspective of your scene. You could have gorgeous color and light, but your perspective is so mismatched and your proportions are gone, the whole piece just falls apart. So when I'm do working on a particular piece, I constantly circle around it, fixing and adjusting things on a very even level. And I, when I'm doing this, I'm constantly addressing what I you know, analyze as one of the weaker aspects of it, whether it's a subtlety of brush strokes whether it's the amplification of movement or whether it's a more smaller detail. I want everything to kind of be on the same level 
and i want that level of course to constantly get higher and higher it's just something to think about you know because like if you know a particular part of your work isn't working as well you got to just not make excuses right get in there fix it find an extra tutorial to fix it ask a friend to help you do whatever you can because then like the efforts tend to right <laughs> show diminishing returns as we're just ignoring weaknesses and parts we know we can do better in our picture and we have to do better well everybody this is wrapping up here as i put the remaining touches on this if you have any questions about any of this let me know below there's also links for everything i mentioned including the patreon my art school my mentorship the classes i run is also below so do take care now and keep on creating